Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. And Jesus, the Christ, the promised one, the Savior for all men, the forgiver of sins, and the light of the world. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. And together God's people say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, friends, we are continuing our study in the Red Letter series, and today we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to pick up in verse 13. So if you have your Bibles in front of you, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus, the Christ. Now, as we are accustomed to do, let's back up and let's take a closer look at what we have just read. Jesus looks at his disciples, his closest followers, and he says unto them, whom do men, who does the world say that I am? Now, stop and think about this for a moment. If you were to ask your friends, your family, your co-workers, who do people say that I am? You're going to get varied views and opinions. Now, some may say that you're a mean-spirited person. Some may say that you're crazy. Some may say that you're a religious fanatic. But deep in your heart, you know who you are. You know your motives. You know your intentions. You know your character and your personality. But you see, for each of us, we are three people. We are who we see ourselves as, we are who others see us as, and then we are who God sees us as. And if you were to collect all of these people in one room that we have just discussed, and each one offered a different opinion on who you were, would it not be important to you that they would know you for who you truly are? And wouldn't you be hurt and disappointed that no matter how good your motives and your intentions, other people see you in such a blemished view? And so now that we can relate to that, think about this question that Jesus is asking. Who do people say that I am? And of course, the same responses that you would get by quizzing many of those you know to who Jesus is today, you get the same thing from the men in the time in which Jesus lived. And so the disciples respond to him and say, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was the most recent prophet that the people of Israel had had. He had been killed. And so some say that you are John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Why? Because their message was so much the same. Go back and look at the message of John the Baptist. He said many of the things almost verbatim of that which Jesus was teaching. Why? Because the word of God is unchanging. And it doesn't matter who says it, John the Baptist, Elijah, Moses, or Jesus, the son of God himself, it's the same message being communicated from an almighty God to the people of this earth. They continue and say, some say that you're Elijah because you're performing these great miraculous deeds. And the last time that we saw this was with Elijah. And so they're equating the two together. Others say that you are Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. 
Now, what is the commonality of all of these answers? People say that you are merely human. No one is saying that you are God divine entered in among men walking on earth in flesh. And so Jesus now looks to them and says, okay, well, that's what they say, but you've been walking with me for all this time. You've seen me in the most private and intimate moments. Who do you say that I am? And as so often happens, Peter is the first to speak up. He says, thou art the Christ, the anointed one, the promised one. You see, his disciples were Jews and they knew Jewish history. They were very familiar with the writings that we call the Old Testament, but the writings of Moses and the prophets the Psalms, the Proverbs, the book of Job. And they know that through all of these writings that Jesus is promised. The anointed one is promised. The Messiah is promised. He who is to come, the deliverer of Israel. And so Peter says, it is you. I'm familiar with these texts and you fit the bill on every prophecy that has been told to us. You are the anointed one. You're the one that we've been waiting for. You are the son of the living God. Now to better understand that, go back to Isaiah and look at chapter 9, verse 6, the prophecy about the anointed one, and look at what it says. Unto us a child is born. He doesn't come as a man. He's going to come as a child, as an infant. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now, this is what the people of Israel were looking for. They were looking for someone to bring them out from under the bondage of the Roman rule. And that is what is promised about him. The government shall be upon his shoulder. He will be a ruler. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father the prince of peace. So as Peter is responding to this question, no doubt this passage is going through his mind. And he says, we know the anointed one will come as a child, but he will be the everlasting father in a child's body. He will be the mighty God in human flesh. He will be, as Peter says, the son of the living God. Now, notice he says living God. They lived in a world where there were many gods, but these gods were stone. These gods were wood. They didn't move. They didn't breathe. They didn't talk. They weren't living. But God Jehovah, Yahweh of the people of Israel has always been, will always be the living God. Not only is he alive among his people, but he is the God of the living. Because he brings us out of the shackles of sin and the reign of death, and he offers us new life through grace by faith. And so in verse 17, Jesus answers and says unto him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. You are blessed among men. Just as Mary was blessed among women, Peter was blessed among men because he saw a truth that many overlooked. And that's what Jesus says. He says, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. The prophets of Israel have not revealed this unto you. The leaders and rulers of Israel have not revealed this unto you. And I, Jesus, have not revealed this unto you. But this has been revealed unto you by my Father, which is in heaven. And I say unto you, Peter, because you understand this, you are Peter, And upon this rock of truth that you have stated, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now he says, upon this rock of truth, I will build my church. Well, what is the rock of truth? Is it just that Jesus is the promised one? Is it just that Jesus is the son of the living God? Or is it much deeper than that? Well, for the answer, look at 1 John chapter 4. And look specifically at verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Well, if you were to ask the Pharisees and the Sadducees 
as they were debating with Jesus standing right in front of them, if Jesus of Nazareth was standing in front of them in the flesh, they would have obviously said yes. Does that mean that they are of God as we are told in verse 2? Well, of course not. So there has to be a deeper implication here. And so let's look at the verse again. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. So could we not read it like this? Every spirit that confesses that God the Father has come in the flesh is of God. Because that's who Jesus was. That's who he is. He is God the Father in the flesh. And so just acknowledging that Jesus was a human being on planet earth, that he came in the flesh, isn't enough. We must acknowledge that he is God Almighty walking among men in the flesh. And that separates him from every other man on planet earth. And that is the truth in which Jesus builds his body, his church. And because that truth is so profound and lofty, high and lifted up, the gates of hell itself shall not prevail against it. Hallelujah. Well, verse 19, I will give unto thee, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. In other words, whatsoever you refuse to forgive on earth, I will not forgive when they arrive at the gates of heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Or whatsoever you decide to forgive on earth, I will forgive when they arrive at the gates of heaven. And we know this is what he's saying because of two verses. John chapter 20 and verse 23 says, Whosoever sins you remit or forgive, let go, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. And so Jesus is saying, if you forgive, I will forgive. If you hold them accountable, I will hold them accountable. Now, this doesn't mean that we have a right to hold unforgiveness in our hearts. This is speaking more to the matter of church discipline, which is what we find in Matthew chapter 18, and we're quickly approaching that. So I'm not going to go into deep detail on it, but if you look at Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through around 20, basically, if your brother sends a sin against you, go and tell him. If he, if he repents, you've won your brother back. If he doesn't, go to him with two or more so that they know that you're not attacking him from a one-sided opinion, that this is a majority view. And if he repents, you've won your brother back. If he doesn't repent, stand him up in front of the whole church as a matter of embarrassment and maybe then he will repent. If he doesn't, treat him as a heathen. And so it doesn't mean that if someone wrongs us, we're not to forgive them because Jesus said to forgive them 70 times 7. In other words, just keep on forgiving them, no matter how much they have wronged us. What he's saying here is that there is a standard to live up to. And when someone comes into the body, we should expect them to carry the banner of the Lord Jesus in the same way that Jesus himself lived his life upon this earth. And so if they're practicing drunkenness or they're practicing homosexuality or they're practicing adultery or fornication or cheating or lying or robbing from people, they are not a part of the body. And so if you hold them to such a high standard and they're unwilling to live that way and you bar them from the fellowship, so will I bar them from the kingdom of heaven. Because if they're not living for me on planet earth, they're certainly not going to live for me when they arrive at the gates. You see, Jesus is the head of the church. He is the head of the body. And so he is master and we as his servants, even his slaves, must do what our master has commanded us. And if that's not the way that we're living our lives, then we have no right to call ourselves part of the body. And Jesus ends in verse 20 and he says, Then he charged his disciples, because they now know the truth, that they should tell no man that he was, that he is, Jesus the Christ. And the reason for this is Jesus had an appointed time to go to the cross. 
It couldn't be a day too soon and it couldn't be a day too late. There was an appointed time for his death and burial. And there was an appointed time for his resurrection three days later. And so Jesus is basically saying, my time has not come. So don't reveal this to others. Their eyes have been blinded for a very specific purpose. And just as I speak in parables unto them so that they might not understand the truth, so too shall you not reveal the truth of who I am unto them. Well, friends, that brings us to the end of our study today. And I just want to leave you with simply this. Who do you say that Jesus is? Is he the promised one all the way back from Genesis chapter 3? The one whom Satan would bruise his heel and yet he would crush the head of Satan? Is he the ark of safety and salvation that we see through the story of Noah? Is he the serpent upon the post that Moses had to lift high that would heal all those that looked upon it? Is he the divine and holy one whose life no man has ever equaled? Or is he merely a great prophet in your mind, such as Muhammad or Buddha or Gandhi or others? Friends, this is an important question that you must come to terms with because your very eternal security depends upon it. So again, who do you say that he is? Well, I love you, friends. Now, may your journey be blessed. May your heart be full of joy. May there be a spring in your step and a song on your lips. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you in Jesus. I'll see you on the next video.